Hi, Jeremy Cordo in the Court of Public Opinion. I'm just on air here to let you know that we'll be live streaming the Court of Public Opinion every Friday between 9 o'clock and 12 on jeremycordo.com. Please join us. We'd love to have you. Welcome to Hong Kong Confidential. I'm Jules Hannaford and I'm your host. I'm an Australian woman and I've been living in Hong Kong for many years. I'm a mother, a teacher, an author, and I want to share my wisdom and the wisdom of others with you. Thanks for joining me and I hope you enjoy the show. Today I'm here with Darius Jadu. Hi, Darius. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Jules. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Darius, what brought you to Hong Kong? I'm originally from Togo. It's a very small French-speaking country in the West Africa. And I came here back in 2012, but mostly because of the situation back in my country. And I was not able to, you know, live in there and remain there. So as I had to, you know, flee my country, so the best and easiest choices I have is to end up in China. Why did you choose China? It wasn't a choice, you know, as in it looks to be, but it's because first China is very open to many countries in Africa uh, because of business and that allow visa process easy. As long as you are traveling for business purpose, a day or two, you can get your visa. So that's the quickest way for me. You started off in China before you came to Hong Kong. My flight landed in Guangzhou in China, and then I spent a few days there to find my way to Hong Kong. You know you wanted to come yes, down to yes, Hong I Kong. Yes, I got a visa for, for China and a visa for Hong Kong before leaving my country. Why did you decide to come to Hong Kong rather than China? I was a little bit aware of the United Nations presence in Hong Kong, that my objective is to seek asylum in Hong Kong. But then in China, I did not have so much information about it. So I didn't plan to remain in China as I was landing there. I guess you didn't speak Putonghua and yeah. there's more English speaking in Hong Kong. Exactly, so that would have exactly. been helpful too. Yes, for, exactly. Yeah. So what does seeking asylum mean? What does that term mean? Seeking asylum is actually asking for protection and based on fears that you have from a place you're coming from. And then it's just a process to become a refugee, a recognized refugee. So in the process, as a starter, you are an, an asylum seeker. And then once the, the status is granted to you, then you become officially a refugee. So oh, that's how right, it is. That was going, I was going to ask you that, yeah. what the difference is between an asylum seeker and a refugee. Yeah. So I didn't realize that asylum seeking is the first part of the process. It's the first part of the process. And then... You get approval for that, do you, from the Hong Kong government, and yeah. then you become a refugee. Exactly. And does that mean as an asylum seeker, you get no sort of support from the government or anybody in Hong Kong unless you find some sort of NGO to support you? There is support for asylum seekers in Hong Kong. Oh, okay. It's just that it's a little bit limited. The support basically is about rental assistance, which is about 1,500 Hong Kong dollar per month. Per month, that's yes. nothing. Yes, oh that's, my gosh, yeah, just for the listeners is. out there around the world who yeah. are listening, one of the cheapest properties you could probably get in Hong Kong would be around four or five, six thousand exactly. Hong Kong dollars would be the cheapest, the wouldn't cheapest, it? And yeah. the average that people would pay would be 20,000 Hong Kong dollars. Yeah. 1,500 a month is so that's, little. Yeah, so that's why we struggle with. How do you supplement that? Do you have to live in the share houses with a lot of people? Do you get help from groups like Christian Action? How does that work? For me personally, from the beginning, I had to stay in shelter. That is kind of arranged by some of the organizations because we could not afford as a beginner in Hong Kong. We don't know how things work here. And sometimes it takes some time for assistance to be approved. So I started in the shelter. And then at the end, I have to, you know, share a place with other friends. Because with the money, you can't afford having a place by your own. So we share places. And then at some point, also some organization will kind of help a little bit with some assistance that may kind of help top up your rent, but still not enough. I mean, maybe sometime up to 500, you can have as a help for the month. So it means 
can be 2000 in total. So we see the gap is still there, yes. you know, and, for you to fill. Yeah. And the government gives you a small amount of money for food as well. Exactly. It's 1200 Hong Kong dollar oh, for food what? per month. That's all. About 40 per day. Then if you, oh in average. Gosh. So, so for the people out there listening outside of Hong Kong, an average person, I think, would spend at least about $800 a week on food. Yeah. Wouldn't they? So 1200 a month. A month. It's nothing. And that gives you nothing for any sort of entertainment or nope. clothes or anything like that because you would hardly manage to live, you know, pay rent and eat on yeah. that money. Yeah. So what was that like having to live like that? The idea actually for the government is for you just to remain here and do nothing while you're waiting. So they think, for example, that 1200 for the food is actually not by cash that is given to us, but it's by food cart or coupon that you need to use in the supermarket and buy fresh food to cook by yourself. Oh, so you yeah. can't spend it on medicine or anything else? No. Nope. Oh. No, nope, you can't. It's only to buy food items from the supermarket and then you cook at home by yourself. So that's the idea. So you just stay home and eat while waiting. No right to do anything else, basically. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So obviously you can't work in Hong Kong. Yes, not allowed to. So that must be very bad for your self-esteem and just for boredom. Yep, it is. It is. It's actually stressful. You know, when you see Hong Kong as a busy place, when everybody's busy, like everybody's having name cards, say I do this and do that. And then you wake up every single day for years and you're not entitled to do anything. And even sometimes when you introduce yourself to people, and then it happened that you have to say, oh, yeah, I'm a refugee in Hong Kong. People will be like, oh, really? And then everything stopped there because it kind of brings the sense of being a needy, being a burden, being a kind of, oh, it's all negative, you know, that follows. So it makes people look down you and then it's just like you nobody in the society. And then it keeps putting you in depression for the rest of the life you spend as a refugee. I can't imagine how difficult that would be. So it there is. is a bit of a stigma involved with being a refugee yes. and you have noticed people treating you differently the minute they know yes. that you're a refugee. Yes. Can you give me an example of how that impacted you in a situation? Like sometimes people are really interested in you and then I get to like kind of some activity sometime and then you mingle with people and talking and people are kind of introducing themselves. And then you talk to people and then at first they don't know you and they're kind of interested in you. You're like, yeah, what do you do in Hong Kong? And once you start telling your story, you'll be like, oh, okay, really? Oh, I see. And then in the next few seconds, you see that the conversation change and then people just move away. There's not much you can offer. There's no name card. I mean, things are more business oriented here. So when I'm like kind of talking to you, I'll see what we can do maybe in the future. What are the opportunities we can, you know, kind of give to one another. But as a refugee, there's not much you can give. So you end up seeing people, even sometimes, because maybe it's in the crowd, they try to, you know, show their interest. And then there's no more friendship after, even though you exchange your contact and so on. There's nothing anymore after that, even sometimes. Because you have nothing to offer You have them. nothing to offer, basically. How is that for your self-esteem? For me, it's just like, it kind of breaks me down. But it's also a way for me that I realize I need to do something for myself. Because I can't rely on people as I know already that they don't really value me. So what do I do to value myself? How do I do to like kind of lift myself up? So this is something that I've been, you know, kind of trying for the, you know, past four to five years in Hong Kong, basically. Could you speak English before you came to Hong Kong? I couldn't. Yeah. Wow. No, really? Yes. I'm coming from a French speaking country, as I said earlier, and it's only French, everything, basically. We study English, but that's just a subject at school that you need to pass. And How did you it. manage when you first got here? Because you wouldn't have spoken Cantonese either. No. Nope. So what was that like? It was terrible, actually. I'm sure. It kind of make me a little bit reserved. I don't engage myself much. And it happened that I met people that are from Africa. Some of them speak French. So I could make friends with those people at first. And then with some of the NGOs, like, for example, Christian Action, my casework was a French speaking person. So we kind of talk in French and he helped me also to translate different things. And other friends also helped me when I need to do anything outside there, go to different places. They will help me to go together and translate things for me. That was the beginning because I couldn't speak English or Cantonese. So that's quite lucky that Hong Kong is 
a hub of many international people. Yes, yes, so yes. you were able to find some other French-speaking yes. people. So that's lucky. And then did you take some English classes or have some sort of support to learn English or did you just have to learn on the way? I did have a few months English classes organized by, you know, NGOs. And that helped me in the beginning to kind of pick up basic words that I may need to, you know, maybe asking for services or going to a hospital looking for direction and so on. How can I ask for that in the street and so on? So basically I started with that, but that was just fulfillment. And the remaining was just for my own involvement in the community. You must have been limited even in those social activities yes. when you first got here. So yeah. that's very isolating, isn't it? I was just on my own and there's no friend, there's nobody. And life was pretty boring. Like You wake up in the morning, the only thing you have to do maybe to eat and go and sit down in maybe somewhere or maybe in those NGOs where they allow you to come in and just sit in for the day and waiting for your lunch time or dinner time and something like that and just go back home and so on. That was the routine, basically. There's not much I could involve myself in because of the language barrier. Then when you learned English, were you able to get involved in some programs some that help upskill you or, yeah. and you got involved in the play and things like that? It did help a lot. I'm personally like not very close person. I like going to people and just kind of exchanging, you know, like kind of talking, having conversations. So it helped me a lot to improve my English by engaging with people and talking to people. And then when that happened, I became more confident with my English speaking then it allowed me to get many different opportunities. Even I ended up leading group of people, trying to run programs and so on, which further helped me. And, you know, oh, kind did of, you? What programs were you leading? I was like in a core member of one of the group created by Christian Action and Breakthrough, one of those organizations in Hong Kong. And it was a group just for refugees and Hong Kong local youth and also mainland students to come together and try to kind of know one another and then build a strong community and then serve the local people at the same time. Oh, so great. yeah. So you were running that program. I was in one of the core member that's, that's leading great. the group. And, Fantastic. Yeah. and that must build your self esteem and give you a sense of self because you're exactly. connecting people and giving yeah. back to the community and feeling yes. valued and worthwhile. Yeah. And I think that feeling valued and worthwhile can be something that refugees don't often feel. Is that true? Yes, it's true. It's true. And most of my friends, they felt like they are kind of left behind. And there's not much of them being in people's agenda or people's plans to help them or to be part of their life and so on. So you just feel like, oh, these people are not here to help us. We are just on our own and so on. So many people lose hope, actually. Even when they hear, some people hear about organization or government, they always like kind of, oh, these people, there's not much they can offer to us. We just here to waste our life. That's not true, is it? Because there's some real success stories with some yes. refugees from yes. Hong Kong, isn't there? It is. Tell me a little bit about those. Just an example of a case. There was one guy I mentioned in my talk before. He's from Sri Lanka. He was a very good computer programmer and we a little bit from you know, some NGOs, he excelled a lot, but just that Hong Kong government could not really recognize those talents. But that guy, after being resettled from Hong Kong, he worked in one of those top companies in America as IT guy. And that's incredible. And so many more are doing similar things in Hong Kong. Some were asylum seeker. They ended up in, as a refugee and then they got the permission to work. And then now they are impacting in different sectors, different areas, which is incredible. Oh, that's fantastic. So there is hope as a refugee there that is. people can get residencies in Hong Kong and then get work. Many in Hong Kong for refugees, this is not an issue, actually. There's no durable solution for refugees in Hong Kong. Just temporary as you are accepted to be refugee, recently you can get a working permission which is different from the right oh, to right. work. So it's not, oh, and it's not yeah. residency. It's not residency. Oh, okay, you can just right. temporarily work while you're still waiting for being resettled. You mean resettled like going to Canada or yes. Australia, they or send US, people away. Yeah. Why is that? Because Hong Kong is actually not the signatory of the 51 Convention, the Refugee Convention of 1951. So Hong Kong doesn't have any obligation to like, allow refugees to remain here, to settle in Hong Kong. So they can only process them and then open them for resettlement. Any country that is, you know, willing to take them, 
can, you know, kind of go into the process and then take them. So that's why most refugees will move to Canada or US. Basically, right. those two countries are taking refugees from Hong Kong. And then Hong Kong's missing out on some very skilled people. So they? much, so much. And many of the refugees that come from Hong Kong, accountants or lawyers or yes. doctors or teachers, or yeah. they're very highly skilled in their own yeah. countries, aren't they? Yes. And so how does that feel for them to come here and not be able to work? It's such a pity. It's really, really, for the people, it's heartbreaking to see themselves being useless for a very significant period of their life, like not being valued. I have many friends that are, you know, good IT people. Sometimes, just yesterday I was talking with one of my friends and he was telling me another guy is from one of those Middle East country and he was a very good, you know, kind of high position IT guy back in his country. And until now he's still working on, you know, different small things on his own, but just that he won't be allowed to exhibit those talents, you know, as a person in Hong Kong because he's just a refugee. And that's really frustrating. That guy's been here for probably like close to 10 years. Oh, Kids are growing. I can't imagine that. And there's nothing, you know, being done about that, which is, is so serious. So how long does this process normally take? The asylum seeker to getting the refugee permit to then being either given the permit to work in Hong Kong or being resettled somewhere else? What's the usual uh, length of time? It takes at least seven years for oh people, my gosh, at least. really? In the whole process takes, you know, seven years in average, basically, if I would say. And yeah, from being processed and then be resettled, it's a long journey. Oh my it's a long gosh, journey. so that's a long time yes. to not be able to have employment, especially yeah. if you have a family as well. Yeah, I have friends that have been here for 15 years. And are still in refugee still, status. Yes, yeah. Why does it take so long? Government bureaucracy. Bureaucracy and sometimes it's also about their desire or they don't want to accept people when people actually have genuine cases, you know, serious threats from their place they're coming from. Yeah. So sometimes people can't really go back, but they're not being accepted by the government and then they just remain in the system. Are you saying that the government doesn't necessarily believe their story? Yes. Oh, that's sad, In most cases, it? this is what happened. Like, they feel like they're making it up so that they yeah. can get the status. Yeah. And the acceptance rate, you can check it, is less than 1%. Yes, in Hong Kong. The acceptance, yeah. rate, acceptance rate, rate for the for, work permit? No. No, for residency. For refugees. Oh, for refugees. Seeking asylum and being accepted as a refugee in Hong Kong, you know, from Hong Kong immigration, the acceptance rate is less than 1%. So it means we have, have 99 person that will be rejected. What happens to them? They're sent back to their country. Some, some who cannot really go back, they will still remain here and appeal and appeal and appeal, appeal oh. again for their case. You know, and you that, just keep appealing so yes. you stay here. Yeah. But the acceptance rate is so low. So oh, low. my God. Yeah. Were you accepted as a refugee? My story is a little bit different. I was actually still in my process of like kind of going through interviews and like nothing, you know, determined yet. But at the same time, through the works that I was doing, I met my wife and then later I got married. And then, yeah, I was also applying for the dependent visa as my wife is from Hong Kong and then going through my cases at the same time. But the dependent visa worked out earlier yes. than my case. And then I just got the visa. Oh, great. Congratulations. Yeah. That's you. fantastic. You. And you met Thank your you. wife when you were doing the play, did you? Not through the play, but actually through the group I mentioned earlier, the Global Youth Connects, which is the group that I mentioned earlier with the Hong Kong local youth, the refugees and mainland Chinese coming together and working Oh, great. Working and that's as, how yeah. you met her. Yes, so that's yes, your yes. love story in that's Hong Kong. That's my love story, oh, yes. fantastic. Yeah, that's great. You. I'm you. so pleased for you. Thank you. Now that means, have you been able to get work since you got your dependent visa? I can work and I've been working just part-time for quite a while now. Like a few, six months ago, I got my visa and I actually didn't want to get into full-time work straight away because I was still having the desire to contribute to, you know, the issues about the refugees in Hong Kong. So I travel a lot and, you know, going through courses and doing conferences and giving speeches. Yes, I saw your places. TED Talk. Yeah. Your TED Talk's fantastic. What's it called so people can find it? It's just the title is about refugees not being a burden. That's right. So, okay, yeah. great. It's easy to find it's on YouTube. Really, yeah, yeah, It's a really good TED Talk. So yes. if the listeners out there would like to look at Darius's TED Talk, check it out. Refugees are not a burden. Yes. 
and it's a Hong Kong TED Talk. Yes. Would you see yourself as a bit of an activist for refugees now? I do. Actually, planning to work on that much further. And I just don't feel like, I mean, I have my Hong Kong residency now and I'm free to do anything, but I don't feel good to just say, okay, it's done. Now I have to face my own life. And that's it. When I see that there are so many of my friends struggling in the system and they are not having the chances that I have. So I think it's my duty also to do something and give back to them and try to improve life of, you know, those that I can help. That's really great. And I think that that's a really lovely sentiment. And I'm sure that many people out there would appreciate that. And you're already making an impact by doing the TED Talk. I've seen you at human rights yes, events. Yes. You're here doing this podcast. So you're doing great things already, yeah, which I'm is trying. awesome. Yeah, it's Thank really you. good. I'm, I you. feel super proud of you. And I hope that this can make a difference as well. And how can people out there in Hong Kong help refugees? What can people do? For me, as somebody who lives in this system for so many years, I usually have very less to ask people to do. I'm not working in any NGO to ask people to give donation and so on. This is mainly for NGOs, you know, working people. But for me, as somebody who lived in the system, I feel like the thing to do is pretty much getting in touch with these people and finding a way that can change their life definitely. Whether by sponsoring them to study or even if you have the means to take them to other country where they can restart a new life, recover their dignity, that would be the best option. Because I don't see the fact of helping and trying to solve some basic needs for them while they remain here, not having any right to do anything for the rest of their life. Basically, they will still fall into destitute. But when their life is completely changed, they recover their dignity, then it's the beginning of a new life that they deserve to live. So this is what I see, helping them move out, sponsor them, change their status. They can study, they can go out of Hong Kong and a new life, basically. Can a refugee study in Hong Kong? You can apply for a study visa, can you? But you, can, you need you to obviously have the money to the money. go to study. Yes, yes. To study. So that's a way that people in Hong Kong, and there's corporations with a lot of money in Hong they Kong. They can do there's that. big yeah. corporations. Yes, they can help with so that. So that's a way that they could give back, sponsor, sponsor a, yeah. a young refugee through yes. university for yes. three years in Hong Kong. Yeah. That's only going to be around about $150,000. Yeah. That is not much to it's some of these much. big corporations. Yeah. Let's put the challenge out there because there are some companies like Goldman Sachs and there are a number of different companies out there that are trying to make a difference with diversity and inclusion. And there's some really big strides being made out there. Yeah. So let's put the challenge out there to big corporations in Hong Kong to put some money forward to help refugees study. And if they wanted to do that, they could do that through Christian Action, could they? Definitely, they can do that. It's pretty fine and good to go through NGOs because sometimes for those companies, they can't really get in touch with refugees. They, no, they can't find them. <laughs> yeah. They can't find yeah. them. So it's good to go through NGOs and, you know, yeah. kind of. So see what who, are some yeah. other NGOs they could contact in Hong Kong? Christian Action, Amnesty International. Yeah, Christian Action is one of them. They can contact the Vine, the Branches of Hope. That's the new name for the organization. It's one of the organizations dealing with refugees, you know, as a church organization. So apart from those, there's not much I have in mind that. Okay, that's great. But that's two that people can approach. You know, there might be lots of people out there who belong to a business or an organization that's quite large in Hong Kong listening to this podcast. Yeah. So go and talk to your HR departments because there are many organizations who have money that they want to give back to the community and mm -hmm. they do want to make a difference. Yeah. And so let's hope that something comes from this. Definitely. Yeah, yeah that'd be uh, amazing. That's my hope too. There's also things like getting them involved in music programs or cooking programs or invite them in to get a qualification or yeah. join a program where yeah. they don't have to pay or yeah. you cover those costs. Yeah. I think one of the other things they could do is just talk to them and befriend them and treat Be them friends. with respect yeah. and don't do the turning away once you find out someone's a refugee. That's really important. That's one of the very important points. It's not only about Oh yeah, I give you money, get out of here, go do something. But friendship gives kind of support that is beyond any material things that people can get. I mean, I got it from people in Hong Kong that have been with me from the day one until now. 
always supporting me. This also gives you strength to make good use of the opportunities that are given to you because, you know, people are, you know, expecting you to be better. They are supporting you and then you feel like you owe them something. You need to respond to the support they're giving to you. So it kind of gives you energy, you know, to go further in life. I think that really comes down to the fundamental thing that relationships are the cornerstone of life, aren't they? And, you know, forging relationships with people and really connecting with people, no matter what their status, is really important. It's very, very important, yeah. Can refugees actually get residency in Hong Kong? I think there's been just one or two. Has there or do you know? Residency in Hong Kong is not an option for a refugee. Oh, it's not. It's okay. not it's unless only the work permit yes. or if they if you get, get married, a dependent yes, visa, yes, get married then, or yeah. that's really it, isn't it? Or you can get the study visa as well. Study visa mm-hmm. and then you study here and then you remain here for years and then you become like resident and so on. That's maybe another option. But just as a refugee, that is right, no... It's not an option. Oh, what a shame. So it'd be great if the government would change their policies on that, wouldn't it? That would be great, but I really don't have so much hope on no, that you because don't think it happen. applies to the whole system to change mm. for that to happen. Yeah. yeah. Have you used music yourself to connect with people? I did. What do you do? What's your musical skills and your interests? I play drum, African drum, and I've used that a lot to connect with people. And I've been into so many outreach programs in schools. I've been in these schools and many other one and it's just great to you know connect with people through music where you don't need to say anything and then people are just happy and then they'll kind of discover a very good and open part of you which set a platform for you now to connect and you know kind of becoming friends and you know much further so I've used music a lot, yeah. drumming. And yeah. creativity is so good for the soul, it's isn't so it? Good, it's so good. good. And music is a way of connecting people. It's yeah. like a universal language, isn't yes, it? Yes, yes, yes. So um, that's amazing. It is. Tell me about your experience in the play. What was the play and how did you come to do that? And did that take a lot of courage? It took a lot of courage. First, I have this background of, you know, doing drama back home, but it was so minor scale stuff like, Maybe school, school plays, school yeah. play, those okay, kind cool. of small things. Yeah. And yeah, and that was uh, through support because it was a play that we're having many casts. And then the director was like, okay, let me try this guy. And then I tried it out actually. And then she felt like this guy might be great for this. And then as that responsibility was given to me, I felt like, oh, this is something that I love doing. But at the same time, people trust me. And then I can do this and I can prove that I'm up to this. And that gave me the strength, you know, to go through the whole play and then so many support from right and left. And the whole team that I work in at that time, they were really, really, really supportive. One of the main cast is uh, a Hong Kong singer. And then she was also really, really supportive to the show. We were like kind of friends, not just like kind of cast coming together, but we spent real time together and knowing one another and everything become just normal as a play and as a real life story. And then that's how we went through it. And it was great. The response from, you know, the public, people liked it. And yeah. Oh, wow. That's great. When did you do this? It was in 2014. Oh, great. Would you do another one? Definitely. If I had a chance, I would do it again. Oh, good for you. Yeah, Yeah. that's so exciting. How cool. Also, do you play football? I Sorry, I'm not stereotyping. Football. I've actually researched. <laughs> no, it's okay. I play football. This and is how my has main, that yeah. been for connecting with people and making friends and relationships? It's another great way, you know, talking about music and living music and going to sports. Sport is another one that connects people so easily. And I love sport. I love playing football. And this has been my whole life. Actually, since... you got a football top on, yeah, Liverpool yes, top. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So I'm a football person and since we were a child, we just play in the street anywhere, you know, for any break we have. So being in Hong Kong, having the chance to play football gave me that chance to connect people in a much easier way. I played with one of the team, which is actually built by refugees. Like the team was founded by a friend of mine from Central Africa. He's an African guy. He was working in Hong Kong, but he felt like he can set this platform for, you know, all these guys who come together. And as I'm a friend of him, and then I was invited to join the team, I felt like, wow, this is something great. I can contribute to it. 
And then so now through the team, we connect with the local community. We organize activity. People know us. People trust us. The team was originally composed by refugees. But nowadays we have refugees. We have ethnic minorities from all, you know, South Asian country. And we have Hong Kong youth that are main players in the team. So now the team is like kind of different background. It's expanded it's to everybody. like everybody. Isn't that great? More than 10 countries. Are I you say. successful? Successful, yes. I bet. Yes, <laughs> yes. Many African children, yeah. because they play so much football, they yeah. come here with some mad skills, don't exactly. they? Exactly, yes, yes, <laughs> So yes. I bet you've got a really strong team. We have a very strong team. Just yesterday, we play against one of the Premier League team in Hong Kong. They usually call us for friendly games and they don't call anybody because they know our team and they see the challenge level is it's really high. high. Wow. And then we always play them and it's really, really intense game. And we lost, yes, but the loss is kind of applaud because it you know a, they are professional, game. Yeah, a professional, professional team and we are just amateur and we and just you play can hold your own we can hold them. yeah is there possibilities for football sponsorship or sports visas or anything like that i don't it really even possible. know what i'm asking yes it is, <laughs> is possible, possible but we haven't experienced that yet oh, okay because of the background of our players people are a little bit worried in engaging into this process that sometimes look like troublesome and okay. really long but yeah. we are working on that. that. We're that hopeful that this will future. happen in the future. Yeah. But I guess that sport is also so good for personal development. Yeah. And if you're living a life as an asylum seeker or a refugee, to have that area where you can really succeed and excel yeah. must be so good for the self-esteem of the it person. Is, yeah. 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 Have you been doing stuff with the kids in Hong Kong, like doing any football sort of training or yes. camps? Oh, great. Yeah, Tell me about I that. Did. First of all, with my football team. We usually, we some like time to time organize football camp where we kind of, you know, let kids join and then we train them and, you know, have fun with them. So one of our strengths during those programs is also about joining the football that we are very good at and then including music to it. So all this together make it just fun in a ah. way that we train them and play football with them. And then at the end, we try to come together and then play with some the drum music. with them. Oh, and fantastic. then they just like, it's just kind of happy. I you bet know, the yeah, kids yeah. love that. They love it. And yeah. that's marrying sport and music together. Yeah. And, and it, it really just work beautifully. Fantastic. What yeah. a great idea. So is. is this something that you offer in the school holidays or regularly? Usually or is it just during every school now and again? holidays because kids are more available during yeah. that period. School time is really hard to gather them. Yeah, yeah. So during holidays, it's easier. Oh, yeah. wow. That's amazing. How was it doing that TED Talk? How did that feel? Because I think that's amazing because you've got to memorize about 15 minutes, don't you, of yes, your speech? Yes, yes, And you go through a training process. Yes, yes. So tell me about that. What was that like? It was really challenging I at first. Bet. And to be honest, I can't really remember how I've been through it. It just amazed me personally. I felt like, wow, I did it and it was great. But the process was just like, first of all, I was recommended and then I got selected. And then I was empowered and then I was coached by people who already have the experience and who also are good into this communication stuff. And I mean, I've got support from people during the drafting of my talk and so on. I wrote my talk, but then I had a coach that will guide me say, okay, this idea, I think you put it earlier, this you put it back, this you do this and that, arranging the sequence and everything for the flow and so on. So. It was easy for me because first of all, it was my story. So I don't need to struggle too much on remembering, but just that when it has to be for like in different sequence, in different order, then sometimes it's a little bit troublesome because you have to stick to yeah. that. And did yeah. you stick to it or did you make any mistakes? Because you didn't seem to make any. You I did. seemed so calm, so cool. Yeah. You did such an awesome job. Did you stick to it or did you like mix it Actually, a bit? I stick to it. It was just what I prepared. Wow. There was a little bit hesitation during it because... I didn't notice. If you're in front of people, you'll be talking and the pressure from people, yes, they you are get always nervous, you get nervous yeah. and then you might make mistakes. But I was lucky enough to find a way to keep myself calm and just focus. And at some point, I almost cracked, but I still hold myself in a way that everything just come. You seem it was so just calm like and composed. One you, second yeah. delay at some point where I needed to remember my next line. But from the point of view of someone watching... You didn't notice. Exactly. That's nothing. But myself, I knew that I struggled 
like at some point near the end, but I was lucky enough to remember and just continue the flow. And then for the last few paragraphs, I knew I was going to the end. So I was even more relaxed and I was like, kind of, okay, this is going yeah, well. You're it's going to finish. And yeah, great. it oh, was a great experience for me. Congratulations. You yeah. did an amazing job. Thank you. Thank you. And what's been the response to this TED Talk? Have you had people, random people contacting you? Have you had people recognizing yeah. you? After this TED Talk, I kind of had so many opportunities and people kind of realized my abilities and so on. They give me chances. I've been called from here and there. And you opened up so many gates for me. You know, oh, that's like, brilliant. So yeah. have you been asked to like do some public speaking or come and talk on certain issues or about refugees or to play music or anything? For example, one of the outcome of the TED Talk was that I went to the Justice Conference Asia a few months ago. Like yeah, that was in October. Yeah. And then that was the Justice Conference that is organized every year in Hong Kong. And then I was invited to be a speaker because of how my TED Talk was. And then I grabbed that chances and then I was on stage again. Yeah. So it was really, really awesome. And apart from that, people like so many interviews with journalists, you know, to know more about my story and what I'm doing just to kind of, you know, relay the message and then talk more about it in the news. And apart from that, people like just a few days ago, I've been contacted to go to Korea and then have a talk there. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that's so, great. And yeah, I couldn't go because the, Time for the visa process wasn't enough for oh, me, okay. but I still can do video conference oh, while great. people are so there. Yeah, I will, I will still be doing oh, stuff. Congratulations. Like, so, so look, yeah. you're really starting to make a difference. Yes, you really yes, are. Yes, That's I amazing. Am. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. So look how much your life has changed. When did you get here in Hong Kong? 2012. Okay. So you've been here for six, six years. years. Yeah. So look how much has changed in six years. So much changed. How yeah. does that make you feel on the inside? In the inside, I know I still have many years ahead of me, but I'm proud of myself. And then I have this sense of achievement. I'm happy about it because I wasn't given much opportunity, but I still tried something and raised myself to a certain level. I mean, before comparing myself as a refugee in the beginning where I talked to people and then people will not be really interested. But nowadays, sometimes I don't need to talk to people, but people reach out to me. Yeah, People exactly. like, oh, are like you I free did, to me? I reach out yeah, to you. you yeah. see? So this is, there's a big change in the process, but it wasn't easy. Yeah. But I'm happy that I made it from very low time Dentist. of my status yeah. in my life to a certain level where people respect me based on what I can do, what I can offer. So I'm happy about that. Are you mentoring any sort of individual new refugees in Hong Kong? Uh, mentoring, no, really. Just friends? Just friends yeah, and okay. talk to people. I know that some people will come to me because of my TED Talk or because of what they know that I'm doing. They'll be like, oh, you, I really need to talk to you. And then people kind of open up and then I see people respect me and give me value for what I'm doing. But so far, mentoring, not really. But I'm still well, planning you things. Are, yeah. I think, but in a wider sense, not just with individuals. Exactly, you're, exactly, you're mentoring exactly. a community in a way, which is really, really nice. Yeah. Do you work for any local NGOs in particular? I'm not working for any NGOs. You're just no, doing your I'm own little I'm just doing my things. And, and yeah. sometimes I can just volunteer, but I'm not like kind of working with any NGOs, basically. What's your dream for the future? Yeah, I was a law student and my dream is still to finish my law degree and have, you know, becoming a lawyer. And that's something that's still very strong in doing. And apart from that, I just want to be that person that can like contribute to a change. It pains me to see that things are not going right. And then I would just be having my own happy time somewhere. I don't feel that this right, is right. Yeah. And looking at how my country is, how things are back home, and then seeing the like injustice, seeing the unfairness, just going online and seeing the story of my country, it reflects the kind of environment some of us grew up in. And I feel like I have a duty, I have a responsibility in doing something about that. So still, I will impact people in Hong Kong, but at the same time, in my long-term plan, I have to go back to Africa and then try to contribute and solve issues that we face there because there we have the big deal. Yeah. In Hong Kong, maybe things might be better a little bit because of the rule of law. Yeah. But if where I come from, there is basically no rule of law. So 
I want to go back and, you know, give back to my community. So I think I can see you maybe being a politician or something like that back in your home country politics. and making some difference, maybe. I don't know, maybe, yeah. maybe. Politics is something that I actually don't really like because I just feel like it corrupts you know, mm. a person at the end because of personal agenda. But how could you go back and make change if you're not in politics? Isn't that where you need to be to make a change? I think we can make a change without being... In politics? Be, so, without being in politics. So perhaps belonging to an, a big NGO it or something NGOs, like that. NGOs. Yeah. You can just set up your own platform mm-hmm. where you can impact people's lives yeah. and educate people to be themselves. Because being in politics then follow with different agenda. But if I focus on people's development, I think I can achieve much more in changing people's mindsets and so on than just having this politician profile. Yes, and that does make a lot of sense because I do believe from what I've read that there is a lot of corruption within politics in many so much. African countries. So, much, so yeah. it'd be good just to avoid all yeah. of that, wouldn't yeah. it? It's really hard to work against the system. There's a system in place in most places. Yes. If you and want you to could progress be in danger, there, you can you? be in danger. Yeah, yeah, so, so much risk. You have got to protect yourself and yeah. not take the too many risks. Yeah. Oh my gosh, good for you. I wish you all the best with that. Thank you, thank you, thank Did you so much. Do you know so how many refugees there are in Hong Kong, roughly? We have up to, if I'm not wrong, in total we will be like around 9,000 people still, oh 9 to 8,000. Oh my 8, gosh, 000. is But there's not so much people remain in the, like going through the interview and being still processed. About the number of people being processed or remain in the system like ongoing cases is about 4,000. Okay, so there might yeah. be another 5,000 who are that now actually, in the refugee and, status. Yeah, still waiting or being already right, interviewed okay. and wondering if they should be, you know, sent back or... It must be hard for some refugees to be living with that knowledge in the back of their mind that you could be sent back to a country where you're in danger. Exactly. This yeah, is the whole thing that's... really yeah, stressful. It is. And I see some of my friends, we've been here for many years. My situation has changed, but when I look at them, I don't really feel happy about my situation being changed because yeah. I see them being in the constant worry. So many question mark. And then you can see from their expression, their, their official expression, their happiness is really not yeah. stable, like kind of. I totally understand that. It is sad that you can't really embrace your change and your new life really yeah. and, the, and the opportunities that you have fully yeah. because you're, of your empathy for yeah. your fellow refugees. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a very altruistic and really empathic and kind way to be. But it's a little bit sad that you can't fully embrace where you're heading. But I think try to remember that everything you're doing could have a little impact on those people. So what you're doing is not only helping yourself, but it's helping them as well, especially like all the media and everything that you're doing. You know, if we get one company that goes, oh, I heard that podcast and let's sponsor a refugee and get in touch with Christian Action and we get one kid in university, that's amazing. Yeah. You know, that's really brilliant. And also like kind of maybe as a message to all those maybe who will be listening to this, there is something ongoing basically that I have in plan, which is just a direct help to individuals that I'm planning to, you know, set and in a way that people can be directly reached out through some of us that already been in the system and to know them that, okay, these people, they are willing to do this and that and that. So in case maybe someone is willing to help out, we know people that we feel like, oh, this friend of us is really good in this. We want that person's life to change and so on. Can reach out to us or to me and so on. And I can connect them to the right people. And then that will be the connection between them and that people only which set a direct network. Which is great. And it's like having a referral, isn't it? You know, you're referring to somebody that you know is hardworking and responsible and a good citizen and that will take the opportunity that's given to them and run with it. Exactly. How can people get in touch with you, Darius, if they want to help out another refugee in Hong Kong? It's very easy. I think people can find me on social media or... In my, Darius my, my, Dario on Facebook. My, yeah, I'm Darius Dario on Facebook and my email, I can just set it out for anybody who can, you know, write it down. And yeah. it's Darius Dario 11 at gmail.com. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So if anybody out there wants to connect with Darius and be referred to somebody who will 
really embrace the opportunity that you can give them and the financial support and the education, then yeah. please, please contact him. And also, I will put Darius's contact details in my show notes yes, as well so definitely. people can get in touch with you. Sure. What advice would you give to any refugees or asylum seekers arriving in Hong Kong? It would be very simple. Look up to your future. Whatever is happening right now, just consider it as being temporary. Opportunity may come from any direction and you have to be ready for it. I have tried my best. I took any opportunities on my way and I try to make sure that everything I do honor my person and also give me a reputation that people can trust me, which gives you much further opportunities and so on. So be open and ready to embrace opportunities. Not being ready for it will make you last in Hong Kong for much longer than maybe you're supposed to be. Yeah, yeah. You won't see the opportunity exactly, that's right in front exactly. of your face you have to if be, you don't keep your eyes and your heart open. That's how it is. Yeah. Oh, that's a beautiful message to finish on. Is there anything else that you wanted to mention before we close off today, Darius? Oh, anything I want to mention, just like say thanks to you, you know, for giving me this opportunity oh, to speak out to the world. thank you so much for coming. World. Yeah. Oh, you're very welcome. And thank you so much for coming to talk to me today. I really appreciate it. It's been fascinating. I feel so proud of you. Thank I you. I feel so hopeful that this awesome city of Hong Kong, yeah. which has got a lot of wealth and opportunity, will be able to step up and help support other young refugees in Hong Kong who are really willing to get support and to change their lives. So thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much too. Yeah. And for my listeners out there, if any of you know somebody you would feel would benefit from listening to this podcast, or if you know anyone that might be able to help support a refugee in Hong Kong, please will you pass this podcast on to them so they can really hear from somebody who knows what he's talking about. If you could take the time to rate and review this podcast on iTunes, that would be amazing. It will help me go up the charts and make it easier for people to find this podcast and get this important message out not only to the Hong Kong community, but to the worldwide community, because there are refugees in every country. Is that true? Or did I make that up? Okay. It is. Yeah, there are refugees in any country. So come on, guys. Many of us have got so much privilege and so many opportunities. Let's get out there and make a difference. And just remember, as Brené Brown says, owning your story and loving ourselves through the process is the bravest thing that we'll ever do. Thank you so much, Darius. It's been a real pleasure. Pleasure too. Thank you. Hi, Confidants. I want to tell you about my Patreon page. I've joined Patreon in the hope of getting sponsorship for my Hong Kong Confidential podcast. Patreon is a great way for my listeners to get on board and sponsor me with monthly payments, and that goes towards my production costs and rewards for my members. If you're interested in checking out my Patreon page, please go to patreon.com and search up Jules Hannaford or Hong Kong Confidential. I would really appreciate you visiting my page. So that brings us to the end of another Hong Kong Confidential podcast. I'm Jules Hannaford. Thanks for joining me. And I hope you'll be with me again next week. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please can you go to iTunes to rate and review it. I would really appreciate your feedback. You can email me at jules at hongkongconfidential.net and you can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Hong Kong Confidential. If you'd like to hit me up on Twitter, it's at Jules Hannaford. I would love to hear from you. Hi, Jeremy Cordo in the Court of Public Opinion. I'm just on air here to let you know that we'll be live streaming the Court of Public Opinion every Friday between 9 o'clock and 12 on jeremycordo.com. Please join us. We'd love to have you.